postgraduate diploma in I think we just lost Marlene there. Um, sounds like a, quite an impressive CV, but uh, um, trust me, it's uh, you learn a lot more in the trenches than uh, what you learn uh, necessarily at university. Education is great, so don't stop learning. Uh, maybe just give it a few minutes for Marlene to get back onto the platform. I think Marlene's back with us now. I'm so sorry, guys. I don't know what happened. I um, got logged out a bit, um, as I was saying. So Quinton is um, very qualified. He has a postgraduate diploma in education management. And most importantly, um, Quinton has a very good background and uh, repertoire um, reputation with everyone who knows him, um, respects him highly, and because of his uh, values and principles, and he's a family man as well, and he has a wealth of real estate experience in both the listed and private property sector, specializing in all aspects of management relating to commercial, retail, industrial, residential, and hotels. He started his uh, career um, in uh, real estate in Cape Town, and he actually uh, one of the things I personally love about um, the company that he co-founded, Spear, is that they specialize in property, um, only properties, only the best properties in Cape Town. And um, just that uh, love for his city and his passion for property um, has uh, really, um, really, really makes him a magnetic person. Um, there's nothing much I can say without a kind of, uh, you know, um, giving you a spoiler of what he's going to talk about. Um, but honestly, I've had the honor to have a few encounters with him. And I know that this uh, event will be very fruitful for our viewers. So thank you so much. And without further ado, Quentin Rossi. Uh, thank you so much, Marlene. And uh, thanks everyone for taking the time to log on today. Um, I consider it a privilege to be able to just take this time to uh, maybe just share a bit of my journey um, with you all and uh, also to, you know, hopefully, you know, blow some wind into your sails uh, today. Um, it's been a rather bizarre uh, 22, 23 months. Um, but in the context of a lifetime, I think, um, you know, we need, to take, we need to take what we can out of this uh, kind of pandemic environment and, and try and use it, uh, use it to our benefit and uh, look to, to learn from it. Um, one of the things that uh, I encountered uh, through some political friends uh, was that they said to me that you can never waste a good crisis. And I think um, if I think about our business and my journey in terms of just uh, navigating and leading uh, Spear through the uh, pandemic, um, it actually would never have been possible uh, without the incredible team 
uh, that I surround myself with. Um, you know, I have the honor and the privilege to deliver results and to engage with the market and to, um, you know, share with the, share with the public uh, all the um, accolades that, uh, that Spear achieves, but it's, um, it's definitely not purely as a result of my efforts. It's, it's, it's a result of an incredible team uh, that have actually bought into the, into the values of our business, um, that have bought into the, the, the vision and the, and, and the strategy of the business. Um, so yeah, I also want to just take this time to thank them uh, for the incredible role that they've played. And uh, yeah, just today, maybe just a bit about myself. Um, I'm from a small town in the Northwest uh, called Rustenburg, uh, very well known for its uh, platinum, uh, platinum industry. Uh, I grew up, I was born in 1981. I uh, grew up in a very strange and um, strange time in our country, which, uh, which many of us are not proud of. Um, uh, but it's important for us to also remember those times to ensure that the same uh, critical areas and critical mistakes are not, um, are not made again. My father was of Italian descent and my mother Afrikaans. Um, so I'm probably what you call a bit of a pavement special with a bit of Italian and Afrikaans and Hungarian blood uh, in me. Um, I came from a family of entrepreneurs. Uh, my father started his own business uh, with about 700 rand that he loaned from my grandfather and uh, serviced the office automation and point of sale industry uh, in the Rustenburg area and um, managed to build a successful business uh, with my mother uh, over a course of then about 24 years. Uh, I had finished school in Rustenburg and within a week of finishing school, I knew that I'd always wanted to move to Cape Town and I loved Cape Town. I thought it was the most, uh, I still think it is the best city in the world. And uh, it's such a privilege for us to be able to generate um, every aspect of our career um, here in the Western Cape. And uh, I truly think that, you know, the business principle about which fear was built uh, was that uh, the, the Western Cape is the investment, uh, investment case for South Africa. Uh, so I'll just get my screen slightly more. Uh, there we go. Just give me one second. There we go. So, yeah, I think um, maybe just to... You know, I wasn't the brightest kid at school. I wasn't the best sportsman, but uh, I did have a lot of guts and uh, I wasn't ever going to allow anybody to place a lid on, on what I could potentially achieve or what I wanted to achieve. And, um, you know, there's a great saying from a guy called I think it's Mark Twain. He says that um, the two most significant uh, days in your life is the day that you're born and the day that you find out why. And, uh, you know, for me, there was always a um, distinct sense that I had, a, I had a purpose. I was here for a reason and, um, and that I would be used through my time and my talent and my treasure uh, to make an impact, not just in, in my own life, in my family's life, but also in the lives of people uh, around me, both from a work perspective, from a social perspective and, um, you know, from a spiritual perspective. And, uh, you know, my worldview is that, uh, you know, if we, you know, if we have, if we have an anchor, um, you know, no matter what the circumstances we face, we end up uh, being able to, you know, to get through those uh, very, very tough times. And I moved down to Cape Town, started studying. I couldn't afford to study full time. Uh, so I studied at UNISA. And as Molly said, I have a, uh, a law qualification and um, I have a postgrad in enterprise management, uh, similar to education management, uh, but just a little bit different. And uh, after Varsity, I had the privilege of, of meeting a very interesting senior advocate that told me that I shouldn't become a lawyer. And uh, I ended up venturing into the real estate space, which is the, the most fortuitous uh, decision um, that I ever made in my entire life because um, getting involved in the real estate space has, uh, uh, shaped, has shaped
So for some reason, I went on to mute there. Uh, just being involved in this space has added incredible value to my life. I think we just have somebody that's on, uh, that's, that's there's a bit of feedback coming. There we go. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, what I wanted to share with you guys today was, um, you know, I operate with the ethos of um, being a servant leader and what that effectively means for me as an individual and for the people that I, that I lead and navigate uh, within Sphere. And uh, yeah, I thought I'd maybe just share a couple of points on that. Um, and one of the things that um, there's a gentleman uh, who's uh, founded, his father founded a company called The Smalling Group. Uh, they employ approximately 40,000 people across uh, Africa, Asia, and uh, parts of North America. And uh, he once said to me that uh, you have to put yourself in the way of luck. Uh, you can't expect the world to stop and take notice of you when you are sitting around not making any moves. And, um, you know, that particular move, you know, for me came in 2011. Um, I had navigated and traversed the real estate sector since uh, around 2006. And I had the incredible privilege of um, uh, co-founding Spear with my two partners, Mike Flax and Abu Varacha. And uh, we started this journey of building a Western Cape focused um, real estate investment business. And one of the things that they told me, because they are slightly more senior, they're better looking than me, but they are slightly older. So hopefully I'll get better with age. Uh, the one thing they told me was that um, uh, this is your um, this is your project. Uh, we don't like to. We're not going to get involved in you know telling you what to do. We trust you, and we think that you've got the ability to grow this business. And um, in 2011, we started a small, in relative property terms, um, uh, portfolio of about 354 million rand. And quite interestingly, that um, one of the people on this uh, particular uh, webinar is the individual that um, was directly involved with uh, funding that initial start, um, a lady by the name of Joan Soms. So Joan, thank you very much for, uh, for entrusting the bank's money to us uh, all those years ago. And, um, and at that point in time, I had um, literally no real experience in managing a, uh, a fund, let alone a 300 million rand fund. Uh, but I had put myself in the way of luck. I had put up my hand, I had showed up, and I said that, you know, whatever is required, I'm going to make it work. And I distinctly recall standing in my study at home. Uh, my daughter was a few months old, and I told my wife that she must take a picture of this day uh, because this is the day that's going to be very significant for us um, uh, over the next couple of decades. And, um, you know, I'm so, I'm so humbled by but what's been, what we have done as a team within Spear. Um, and at that time, you know, I always believed that, you know, if I carry the mantle of, of chief servant uh, within this business uh, from the start, uh, that no matter what, what happened, um, I would never be able to look down on any situation. I would never be able to look down on anyone because I would be, um, in a sense, the lowest uh, uh, chief uh, in our business and what that allowed me to do was to create a incredible culture of empowerment uh, within our business um, uh, individuals that uh, are now making massive uh, decisions within our business um, started with us many years ago with zero real estate experience and um, we took the time to invest into them and to empower them to, to buy into the culture of the business and into the strategy of the business. And today, these individuals are, are, are really the ones that are making us look uh, really good uh, when we have the privilege to deliver uh, results uh, to the market. And, you know, as I said, my primary focus was the uh, collective well-being uh, of the business. And every year, uh, when we sit down before the start of the year, I reiterate to our staff that um, I'm interested in their hopes and dreams. I'm interested in ensuring that as we build this business, that we create uh, wealth for every single one of our staff members. 
Uh, we were very fortunate to be able to put certain structures in place uh, where our staff become uh, shareholders in our business. Yes, our business today is a publicly traded company, uh, but one of the aspects that, um, that I want to remind you of all of you today, um, some that are not yet in the working world, is that your salary will only satisfy you for so long. Um, there always has to be something more uh, that motivates you, that encourages you, and that causes you to get out of bed uh, in the morning to go and do your job to the best of your ability. And uh, I often try and tap into, within the team, you know, tap into every staff member, what is it that, that makes them, what motivates them and why. And I actually, you know, when I talk to them, I want to have, I, I want to have, I want them to have my attention and I want to be focused on what they have to say. And uh, one can actually never discount uh, how valuable that is. Um, you know, our schedules are crazy. Uh, we are looking to build a meaningful business uh, within the Western Cape. Uh, we're very fortunate that our business has grown from a 300 million rand portfolio to uh, just, just, under, just under 5 billion uh, today. Um, Spear County owns 32 properties uh, with solely within the Western Cape, and we are still the only regionally focused real estate investment trust listed on the JSE. Uh, we obtain our diversification through the type of assets that we own. So we invest across asset type, uh, industrial, commercial, and convenience retail specifically, together with mixed use. Uh, strategically, we are in the process of exiting uh, hospitality. Uh, purely because it exposes us to variable income, uh, which is not something that I, myself and the team believe is going to be part of our strategy going forward. Uh, where do we see ourselves? Um, we see ourselves to becoming a meaningful mid-cap fund within the REIT sector uh, and to build a meaningful 15 to maybe 20 billion rand Western Cape only portfolio. Um, and our approach is to remain very close to our assets. Uh, and I think, um, you know, what that allows me to do in terms of modeling that type of servant leadership that I choose to, to lead with is that I'm able to touch every part of the business um, on an ongoing basis. Uh, there's a season that in, 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 in the course of a year where I have to touch the asset management part of the business. I've got to touch the finance part of the business. So I've got to touch the portfolio management part of the business, the development part of the business. The beauty is that because I've empowered uh, each and every one of those individuals, um, you know, to make decisions and to, to make decisions in the best interest of the business. I only have to touch those parts of the business. I don't have to manage those parts of the business, um, uh, business directly because, quite frankly, it would, uh, it would be impossible. And at the end of the day, you know, um, uh, one of the things that uh, Molly will maybe share a bit later is, uh, is a book raffle, and it's a book that I would highly recommend you to read um, called uh, Good to Great. And uh, one of the things that they say in that book is that, you know, the bus is moving forward and the bus is going in the right direction, which is your business. Uh, but what's even more important is the people that fill the seats on, those, on, on that bus. And um, over the years, since 2011, I have been almost surgical in the way that, um, that I've built the team, the type of people, um, the culture that we've, uh, that we've really worked hard on building. And it really is a culture of, um, of, of serving each other as a business, being there for each other, um, never wanting to one-up each other, uh, because there's a lot of that and enough of that going on in other parts of the um, uh, corporate society for us to, uh, you know, to, add, to the, um, add to it unnecessarily, because it's really not our, um, uh, you know, our vibe. And... You know, just in terms of, uh, you know, I consider myself somebody that, um, that has no problem with sharing power. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't choose to hoard power. Uh, it's, a, um, it's possibly you know, more of a trait of an insecure leader that chooses to hold on to power uh, when they hoard it. Um, I hold every single one of the aspects of our business with an open hand uh, because I know when I do that, um, I'm continuously building away from myself. And uh, about two years ago, just at the just before the onset of the pandemic, uh, we had a, um, a, a company-wide uh, session, and I, uh, I told the team um, that I would like us to build a hundred-year-old business. 
And what is significant about building a 100-year-old business is that you're not building uh, for yourself. You're building for people that you possibly will never, ever meet. Um, and by doing that, and you, when you're always making decisions based upon building a 100-year-old business, uh, you're not going to make decisions that would only give you short-term gain uh, for long-term pain. And it's also something to think about, you know, even in your own lives, um, you know, short-term you know, short term benefits um, uh, could be within a certain context could could make sense. Uh, but when you're building towards the long term, you're putting the right foundations into place. Uh, you're putting in the right um, structures within your business that's going to give you sustainability. And within the universe that we operate, uh, one thing that uh, that shareholders uh, desire is um, sustainability, sustainability of income, sustainability of assets, sustainability of management and credibility of management. And uh, that's one thing that's, uh, that's critical to our strategy because I know that in 100, year, in 100 years time, when the spear flag is still flying and the culture that we've, that we've created today uh, most likely uh, would still be in place uh, across the business. And um, yeah, there's a hashtag that, um, that I often use uh, in whether it's in posts or uh, talking to the team, and it really is the teamwork does make the dream work. We are passionate about our business. Uh, we are emotionally invested in our business. And um, if you look at the, the way that our business has actually transcend, transcended um, even the COVID operating environment, uh, we've collected 97% of our rent uh, during this COVID pandemic. Uh, we've maintained a 93% to 94% occupancy rate. Uh, across our portfolio. Uh, we have um, grown our net asset value per share uh, by at least 4% uh, in the last, uh, in the last uh, six to eight months. Uh, but even more than that, we managed to pay, we have managed to not miss one dividend payment. And that took sacrifice. You know, when the pandemic hit, I, um, had, a, had, I had to immediately engage with our business, all the people, our staff, um, via a digital platform. And uh, there were many different levels of discomfort. Uh, people were uh, worried about their jobs, they were worried about their families, they were worried about their health. And we were hit with a very unique situation where we were in the midst of what could be a financial and, and health crisis. And it was very important for me to um, reiterate to our staff um, that when the time, if the time came that um, that we had to make certain or implement certain austerity measures within our business, um, I would be the one to take the biggest pain. Uh, not because I had the biggest balance sheet, uh, because that's what that's what leaders leaders do. You don't um, leaders are there to lead and navigate, but also there to sacrifice and to lead by example. And what we, what we effectively did was we, we had to cut um, and we had to aggressively cut our break-even numbers uh, to, in a bid to ensure that there was never, ever any risk of the business not being able to honor its commitments to its funders uh, and uh, to, its, uh, to its shareholders. And it was incredible because at that time, amidst all of the uncertainty um, we were effectively entering what I would call a fog uh, where you couldn't really see ahead of you. It was very difficult to forecast um, any particular outcome, uh, let alone the fact that, you know, from a fiscal perspective, government just didn't have the resources to, uh, to support uh, the larger corporate or commercial sector in the way that, um, that we saw governments do in, in places like North America, uh, Europe and the UK. Uh, but then again, uh, another lesson uh, that was that that also was very important was, you know, having a strong balance sheet, uh, ensuring that um, you always plan ahead to ensure that you've got a, a bit of cash and you have a um, uh, you have access to to headroom within your within your debt facilities. Marlene, you had a question. Yes, I would just like to um, prompt anyone in the uh, attending the meeting that if you would like to ask questions, um, please, free, free, uh, please feel free to do so in the chat room or you can 
um, put your video on after the after Quentin is done speaking, and you can ask him directly. Thank you. Cool. So, yeah, it's um, you know, it's I think you know, looking back, you know, particularly over the last ten years, um, uh, it's been there's been so many times uh, that you know I can think back where where it hasn't been it hasn't the some of the success or some of the um, achievements of our business um, have been achieved because. Of, I've consistently empowered uh, the people within our business. And it's something that, you know, that I want to encourage you guys to, um, you know, to seek out. Uh, you can, and, you know, I was, I was probably the youngest um, CEO of a listed property company uh, when I took over from my partner, Mike Flax, in 2018. Um, and there was a brief uh, there was a brief season uh, just after becoming group CEO uh, where I possibly suffered from a little bit of uh, imposter syndrome uh, because, you know, you walk into a, into a room and you see all these sector heavyweights and, um, uh, and, and very quickly uh, I, I kind of pulled myself towards myself and I said, um, you've, put in the, you've put in the hard yards um, you have with your team built a great business, and um, uh, in a non very in a very non kind of egotistical way, uh, I kind of I kind of flipped the script, and I and I thought to myself that a lot of these people in this room are looking at me, thinking like, oh man, I wish we only owned properties in the Western Cape um, because Cape Town is the best city in the world, uh, and also the the property fundamentals. Um, uh, you know, make a lot more sense. The Lord only made so much land. We've got a mountain on the one side and an ocean on the other, which means that there's a scarcity, uh, just a natural scarcity of available land to develop. Uh, and also, we, you know, we've got an incredible lifestyle here. Um, some of you may not be from Cape Town, uh, so I'm not knocking any of your um, places of origin. Uh, but yeah, it's a massive, uh, it's a massive, it's a massive passion of mine to. Yeah, promote, promote the Western Cape, uh, Cape Town, and uh, and South Africa. I had the, I had a great privilege of spending time with the group CEO of Investec, Fani Titi, and uh, after he spoke, um, he was giving quite an encouraging talk uh, at a lunch about South Africa and the prospects of South Africa. And right now, the macros aren't looking great, um, but. But I do believe that it's up to every single one of us, not just on this call, but every single one of us within South Africa to do what we can. Um, you know, from, a, from my kind of daily ritual perspective, um, I daily uh, spend time reflecting, uh, praying. Uh, I pray for our, every single one of our staff members uh, for their hopes and their dreams, for their futures. But I also take time and I pray for our government. I pray for our leaders and I pray for a country that's... Um, that will flourish in a country that will um, emerge from this pandemic uh, to become the powerhouse of Africa uh, that we are required to be. And one of the things that, um, that Fani Titi said to me when I asked him, uh, thanks for the great talk and for the great lunch. Um, Investec does serve really good lunches. Uh, I said to him, for a young CEO, what can I, what, what can you share with me um, that I can go back and share with my team from you know today's engagement that you may not have covered, um, and he said to me, "Oh, first of all, it's an unfair question because he felt a little bit uh, he wasn't prepared for that type of question." But he actually answered it perfectly for me, uh, and he said to me that um, uh, I'm just trying to find it here. I wrote it down. Um, he said to me, "Have courage. Take that with you to your team. Have courage." It's an infinitely renewable quality. And always believe that your future will be better than your past. And for me, that was such an incredible bit of advice, that first section of having courage. Um, because before we founded Spear, um, I was sitting across the table of two or three of South Africa's largest property players. And... Um, 
and I was required to have courage because I was, um, you know, I was on the cusp of, um, you know, stepping into something that would become what Spear is today. And there were many times when I doubted myself, trust me. Um, uh, my wife can tell you, uh, my friends can tell you that there were many times when I thought there must be somebody better suited uh, for this role. Um, but the one thing is that, one thing that I've learned over the years is that um, it's not always the best qualified that are used. It's the ones that are available, that are willing to put their hands up, that are willing to show up, and that are willing to put in the yards, but also that are willing to celebrate um, uh, the victories of other people uh, and uh, allow those victories and, those, and your universe to expand uh, as you do that. And, um, yeah, just never to give up. I think, um, you know, if I look at uh, just where I grew up, uh, in the context of the town that I grew up, I was um, just given the nature of my kind of split heritage. I was excluded from uh, many things just in terms of uh, being allowed to participate in certain things, you know, growing up in quite a, uh, a big Afrikaans community. Uh, but I never allowed that to put a lid on me. Um, I distinctly remember uh, my Afrikaans teacher telling me that, um, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe the small town is for me. And there's nothing wrong with small towns. Um, and I said to her, but that's not my, you know, that's not what I believe is, uh, that's not my destiny. And I always believed that there was going to be a significant um, event. Uh, and I believe that, you know, one of those were when I got married, when I became a father twice, fortunately, and uh, when we started Spear. And, you know, just to talk to, you know, how I look at the business, um, I've looked at the business as my third child. And, you know, over the years, that child goes from being in nappies, uh, teething, which is painful, uh, going from, you know, crawling and walking and breaking stuff and then kind of growing up. And it's very much, you know, how it feels to, to run a business, um, how it feels to build a business, uh, because building is tough. And sometimes when you build, you need to break down a little bit. Um, and uh, that uh, in the breaking, sometimes uh, the breakthrough also comes. And uh, so never be afraid to, you know, to, you know, when you've built something, never be afraid to break it down a little bit uh, in order for it to grow or to trim it um, or to prune it. Uh, because oftentimes when you prune a tree, uh, it actually just sparks another another vein of growth. And another thing that was quite significant for me just in my career um, was that um, oftentimes, you know, as we navigate through our career from one degree of um, possible somebody in a success to the other, uh, distractions, distractions come in. And, um, you know, I also want to encourage you guys not to let your hobbies um, shipwreck your careers. Uh, your careers are an incredible conduit pipe for you to, uh, to do good, to learn, to encourage and to empower. And as you do that, you actually set a perfect and beautiful example uh, for those that are watching you because people are always watching you and want to learn from you. And, and I think that um, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, that I can really leave with you at, um, uh, as, as one of those thoughts. And um, you know, if I had to sum up you know, what I often tell uh, my team is that um, whether we're in a season of incredible growth when, uh, when the markets are flying or whether we're in a pandemic, there will always be giants in the land. Uh, you'll always have something that you'll have to face. Um, but if you have the right team around you, if you've created an environment uh, where when the odds are really stacked against you, uh, you see men and women um, stand shoulder to shoulder with you uh, through the good, the bad and the ugly, uh, then you know that um, the foundations are set for an incredible journey uh, and to build an incredible business. So, yeah, I just, um, you know, hopefully I've, you know, shared a little bit uh, about, you know, what it takes. Uh, there's no, there's no, um, there's no magic potion. Uh, it's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. And so it's about having the right people on the bus because when you've got the right people on the bus, uh, they buy into your, um, into your leadership. Uh, and, you know, I'm trusting that, you know, for me as an individual, that um, my career would go from 
you know, being viewed as a career of success uh, to a life of significance, um, which means that I can, you know, empower, educate, um, uh, assist and uh, strengthen the fabric of society and, um, you know, you know, the Quentin Rossies and the Mike Flexes and the Christian Barnards and, you know, the um, uh, Estee and the Clacks and, you know, of tomorrow would sit in these types of uh, ecosystems, um, but that you guys would not shrink back and that you would not allow your circumstances to, um, to dictate uh, where you could potentially go into the future. So thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to share a little bit of, uh, of what I've had the for good fortune of experiencing. Um, and yeah, if there are any questions, I'm happy to, to take any questions. Sorry, so there's... Uh, so what was the position that I held before I became CEO uh, of Spear? So I was the managing director of Spear uh, since inception. And the distinct difference was that, um, you know, I took a heavy operational role uh, within the business uh, and um, effectively from a, uh, a corporate, corporate finance, uh, financial management, property management, asset management, um, I made sure to be executed against all of those, um, against all of those points. So effectively, it was a natural progression in a sense, um, you know, to move towards uh, that um, group CEO position. Uh, but again, you know, I don't necessarily see it as, I don't sit in the ivory tower. I like to kick the tires. I like to uh, touch the business, as I mentioned. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a great title, but it's, um, it's not saying that necessarily, I don't, my identity is not found in my title. Uh, my identity is found in, um, in my belief system. My identity is found in um, things that when everything else passes away, uh, it will still, I'll, I'll still know who I am and be the same person. Uh, then there's a question from Peño. I hope I pronounced it correctly. How does one remain resolute as a leader when it's time to lead, which is usually when it is too well, to calm the noise and to lead those under your care? Um, yeah, there's, I use a lot of kind of analogies about, uh, being in a, in a ship in an ocean. Um, but one thing that's, uh, that's always stood out to me is that the art of navigation is best learned before entering the storm. And, um, yeah, just having the right people around you, um, you know, having people around you that, uh, that, that can give you objective input, uh, but also having a North star, um, you know, I've, uh, I'm a Christian and, um, you know, for me, my North Star really is um, my belief system that, that God had a clear plan for my life before I was even born and uh, has a clear plan for all of my days. And, um, you know, that when I'm facing turmoil, I believe that, uh, you know, he's, he's actually chosen me to lead in this time. And when I adopt that um, perspective, uh, I'm able to lead through the turmoil um, through the goodness of who God is and who I believe he is uh, to me and, and, and how he strengthens me in, in every aspect of that, um, of that turmoil. Um, and uh, which, so next question. Um, yeah, so maybe also yeah, just to calm the noise and to lead those under your care. Um, you know, leading people, and I believe that um, without our people, we actually don't have a business. Uh, we can have great assets, uh, but without our people, we don't have a good business. Um, and in that sense, um, you know, I, I take, I do my best to take an interest in in how they're doing, uh, not just professionally, but also emotionally, and providing the necessary support uh, in that process when they are um, going through a tough time, because we are human first uh, before we are professionals. Uh, which books have you read that have had a substantial impact on your career in property? So I think the, um, the book by Jim Collins, Good to Great, was an exceptional book. Um, and uh, also a book by the late Mark Wainer, Making, Making My Mark. 
uh, because um, you know part of the spear story is obviously featured in that book, and I was, and it's um, it's just the, the way that Mark built uh, his career through Mark Wayne and Associates, and then with uh, into Redefine. Uh, there were so many similarities, and I had the absolute privilege of working with Mark for a, for a period of time, and just um, uh, yeah, just you know, just everything about how he was and what he said in that book about you know kicking the tires. Uh, in your business, uh, you know, understanding the environment that you find yourself in. And that was a great um, and exceptional book, which I would encourage you, all of you, to, to maybe try and um, uh, get uh, get reading. It's not a very long read. Uh, that's been really excellent. Uh, but a lot of the learning has been in the doing. Um, and you can't discount, um, you really can't discount that um, the time in the trenches, um, because sometimes the time in the trenches, there's bullets flying everywhere. Um, there are bullets flying everywhere, but uh, and sometimes there's times of peace, and uh, in the times of peace, you're always preparing for your expansion strategy. Um, then, uh, how did you manage to jump the hurdle of finance for your various projects and first property bought? Uh, so, um, it's I if I think back even pre spear days, um, uh, I was never greedy. So I would um, I brought in my first property was a little retail center consisting of eight shops, and um, although it wasn't a very large acquisition, I couldn't uh, I couldn't take it on by myself. I just didn't have the the, the balance sheet. At the time, to to be able to allow the bank to give me um, to give me the loan. Um, so, in that perspective, without not being greedy, I found a partner, um, and together we put our balance sheets together, and we were able to um, raise the funding uh, on that particular property, which um, we held for a number of years, and ended up uh, subsequent to that, we ended up buying. Uh, the property next to that, um, which was five townhouses, so we had a nice little mix of resi and retail on a, a very nice, uh, very, very much a growing uh, node within Cape Town. Um, so yeah, just uh, you know, try and pool your resources with people that you trust, but also people that you think you can paddle the canoe with, um, because there's no point in you trying to just do a deal with somebody that's got a bit of money, but if their values are different to yours. Um, if they're going to paddle in one direction, you're going to paddle in the other direction. It's going to be it's going to be a disaster. So to have the, find the right partners and um, but have a plan. Like if you're going to go and ask somebody to to back you on a property deal, uh, don't go and say, okay, I want to buy this property and it's going to be great. No, go with a plan. Say this is the property. This is what's happening in the area. This is why I think this is this is going to be a growth node. Um, the, the average rentals of these shops are not really at market. They're slightly under market. I think that, you know, if we can renew the leases with a little bit of um, a little bit of growth and we can try and cut the expenses a little bit, uh, a little bit here and there and negotiate maybe a, a, a better deal on the funding, uh, we could potentially add a bit of upside to the valuation of the property over a period of time. Uh, and then when you go, you know, that's when you go prepared, uh, when you're pitching to a... Um, a potential investor that's going to invest with you, um, and also, yeah, don't, uh, don't, you know, don't take for granted that shareholders' agreements are are very important. Um, you know, understanding what your rights are, understanding what your partner, your your fellow investors' part, uh, rights are, uh, is is very important. It's always best to to agree those things up front. And then, secondly, you know, my law knowledge has helped me immensely. Um, I think that it's an incredible foundation to understand uh, the law, um, to understand just the operation of it. Um, uh, but notwithstanding that, we still rely on you know legal professionals to give us the best tax advice, to give us the um, the best uh, corporate finance advice, to give us the best competition law advice. Um, and uh, it's actually exceptionally um, rewarding. Uh, to, to you know, in the early days, to be able to understand exactly what what we can and cannot do without necessarily having to go and brief a legal team. Uh, so I think that was very very helpful and continues to be very helpful um, uh, in, in in how I kind of uh, conduct my career. 
I think the um, what's been the biggest challenge uh, that I've faced in my career and how did I find the strength to overcome it? Uh, yeah, I think that um, I think there was there was two kind of significant uh, challenges. Um, we had, you know, when we started this business, um, we didn't necessarily have uh, the desire to take it public. Um, we wanted to build a um, a small private private property business uh, that we could, you know, that myself and my partners could build. Uh, and you know, just have something meaningful in the Western Cape. Uh, but there came a point in time where um, I went to them and I said to them, you know, I think we can actually we've got a we've got a great opportunity. You know, the Western Cape's tourism sector was flourishing. Uh, we had the best um, uh, you know audits from the Auditor General in terms of uh, governance, and you know, the investment case for the Western Cape was just continuing to grow and grow and grow. And um, so Africa had, had recently transitioned to the uh, REIT structure, which is uh, previously in the property terms, uh, we were a property loan stock or a property unit trust um, uh, property regime, uh, which wasn't aligned with international best practice. Uh, however, through a lot of hard work um, by people like Estienne de Klerk from Growth Point, they managed to get Treasury to adopt the REIT, um, uh, the REIT legislation. Uh, which then aligns South Africa with um, with international standards and would obviously attract uh, international capital into our shores. And uh, we then decided that that's a good opportunity for us to be able to raise additional capital. Because up until that point in time, uh, we had built from 2011 until 2016, we built up a 1.4 billion rand portfolio. And we effectively, from an equity perspective, um, felt that we've you know, kind of run out of our own uh, gas for this for this car, and uh, we would be putting together a Western Cape focused uh, uh, Western Cape focused REIT. And leading up to that decision, we uh, appointed our sponsor. We did a whole range of kind of pre-roadshow presentations to get a, a feel for whether there's interest for this type of specialist listing from a regional perspective. And then in April, uh, bearing in mind that we set our listing date for November. 2016 in April, uh, around five o'clock in the afternoon, I got a call uh, from our property manager saying that one of our properties was on fire. And at the time, that property had made up about 20% of the total value of the portfolio and was quite a significant uh, asset that would be going into the listing of, um, of Spear in a few months' time. And uh, I arrived on the scene and uh, the fire wasn't under control and um, uh, a bit of a battle ensued with this fire from six o'clock in the evening until one o'clock the next morning, uh, causing quite a bit of damage on the property. And I just stood there and I was, I was speechless because I was watching, um, you know, our, um, our dream of, you know, getting this uh, business uh, to go public with this business kind of uh, burning up. Um, but, but the interesting thing was when the fire, when the fire was uh, put out, um, uh, I remember standing in the in in the square, looking up at the burnt building, and thinking to myself that um, no matter what, there's got to be something. Something has to come out of this, and um, yeah, I just had to really draw on a lot of inner strength, and um, uh, I did have a couple of temper tantrums, and uh, just had to suck it up. And I can tell you that um, out of that kind of disaster, we were actually able to unlock incredible value by actually we demolished a portion of the building and we ended up building probably another 4,000 square meters of GLA uh, onto the property and securing longer term leases from better tenants uh, that we never would have been able to do uh, if that fire never occurred. Um, so yeah, sometimes, um, sometimes uh, the weirdest things happen and you always need to just look at it and say, what is the lesson? What is the opportunity? And how can I um, how can I take advantage of, of this really bad situation? And the second one is COVID. Um, COVID uh, came and, um, you know, arrogantly I thought that, you know, if Poloni couldn't uh, take us out, I wouldn't think that uh, some virus in China could. Uh, but I've been swallowing those words for a long time because the, 
Um, the reality is that uh, none of us could have ever forecasted what, um, what happened uh, during the pandemic. And um, yeah, it really placed, uh, it, it threatened every one of our livelihoods, it threatened our businesses, and um, the, ex the extent of the unknowns was, um, was severe. And I think the, um, uh, you know, the reality is that, you know, in the, even in that time, you know, I had, I went through a time of, um, yeah, a lot of fear. I went through a time of a uh, bit of depression. I went through a time of, um, yeah, just uh, having to try and remind myself um, that even if everything falls apart, um, you know, that I would still have uh, my North Star and my family and uh, I'd have to pick up the pieces and we'd have to start again no matter what because failure just was never something that I would choose to um, include in my narrative. Uh, then what are some of the ideas that upcoming property developers can take advantage of as short-term cash flow that can sustain them while growing the business? Yeah, I think that... Um, you know, up-and-coming property developers, you know, property development is a risky business. And, uh, you know, I don't want to sound like a naysayer, um, but I think, you know, if you, uh, if you can find the right, I mean, find the right partner. Um, if you find an opportunity, don't, don't flaunt it. Uh, find the right partner. And um, even if you, from a short-term cash flow perspective, uh, if you don't have the ability or the balance sheet to take advantage of that opportunity, potentially package it in, a, in a, such an attractive manner that you can generate some sort of a facilitation fee when you pass on that opportunity to a, somebody that can actually um, execute on the development um, and then potentially maybe negotiate some sort of a, um, a achterskot or a, a profit share once the value has been unlocked. Um, that could be a, a potential opportunity. Um, uh, and then also, you know, in terms of it to, the, uh, to whatever extent your property expertise allow um, is to maybe offer some sort of um, consulting or um, maybe, you know, consider entering the property broking um, environment where you can do leasing and sales. My, my career started as a property broker. And I started from the grassroots, um, kicking the tires uh, in, the, in the northern suburbs of Cape Town, in Century City, um, learning every property and knowing who every owner was and dropping off business cards. You know, for the first six months of my career, I thought I was the biggest failure because I didn't do a single lease. Uh, however, there came a time um, uh, when that all changed because all my efforts of building up uh, a network and um, meeting with landlords and putting my two dead boards up um, went from a six months of uh, famine uh, to multiple years of, of, of harvest um, that came through for me. Um, yeah, so I think that's, it's not easy, uh, but the thing is that if you, if you are an aspiring property developer, one of the best places to actually uh, learn a lot about the industry, learn a lot about um, the role players that, uh, that are essential to a development, uh, entering that kind of leasing, leasing and sales environment um, uh, has taught me things that I could never learn uh, anywhere else. Um, how do I think that the rapid changes in the property industry, uh, how do I think about the rapid changes in the property industry and find the real opportunities that represent themselves? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, the, some people consider um, the changes that have happened that have almost been highlighted or spotlights been shone on certain things within the property industry, in particular, like the work from home um, and the impact it will have on offices. Um, you know, the attractiveness, is, uh, attractiveness is of offices as, um, you know, as a growing investment class um, hasn't really been there for the last, um, I would call, decade or so because to construct them is tough, uh, is, is expensive. To get a return in terms of your rentals are, are very difficult and you end up having to, your operating costs end up um, running away with, your, uh, running away with you um, as your income starts to shrink 
uh, as uh, cost increase like rates and taxes and so on and so forth. So, so I think the, the COVID has just shown a spotlight on, on the changes. Uh, but, but what has been evident is that, you know, uh, where I see the opportunity in this current kind of uh, op, uh, environment is finding unique last mile uh, small distribution hubs. Um, you know, the likes of Fortress and the likes of Equitus uh, in South Africa, for that matter, um, kind of are the domineering forces in the large logistics kind of fulfillment space and third party uh, logistics space. Um, but where I see our opportunity is the kind of uh, 2,000 to 3,500 square meter last mile kind of fulfillment uh, spaces uh, where those distribution centers would end up um, creating pickup hubs for people either, um, you know, picking up things that they've ordered online or doing returns. Uh, and I think that's, that's a very exciting area to, um, uh, to, to consider. And then I think the other thing is that um, Africa as a continent is, um, is going to go through a continuous demand for data. Uh, and I think the data center industry is also incredibly unique. You know, from a real estate owner perspective, you know, the capital investment that goes into a data center often outstrips the actual value of the bricks and mortar. And for a landlord, that's like uh, music to our ears because you know that your tenant becomes very sticky in terms of they'll stick around for uh, for a long time. And as we've seen with uh, Terraco, we've seen with Vantage, and we've seen with Amazon Web Services, uh, that there's a massive drive to roll out um, a data center um, uh, a data center footprint um, uh, across South Africa. And the other area within the sector that I think is there's major opportunities in renewable energy. Uh, we've reinvested heavily into solar, and we see solar as part and parcel of, of our investment strategy in every every aspect and every investment we make. Uh, we look at how we can implement solar, and effectively what we've done is we've taken our portfolio and we've unlocked another asset type within our portfolio, which is which is our roof space. Typically, the roof was there to keep you dry and keep you warm. Or keep you cool and uh, it was a necessary requirement for a building to to be around but now we've effectively created new cash flows uh, within our business and i think that's a very exciting industry and if somebody you know if you can team up with the right uh, team that can execute it i think there's a strong argument to say that um that if somebody would take this upon themselves to unlock the roof space as an asset class across the real estate sector i think there's a lot of opportunity there and then in terms of, uh, so Michaela had a question, do you think that the Western cash property sector is saturated in comparison to some of the other larger metros in SA? Or is there still enough growing demand for a startup to better pay investors against significant market share and grow into the likes of Spear and Growth Point to focus on the Western Cape? Yeah, I think, you know, I think there's still lots of opportunities uh, within the Western Cape. Um, you know, uh, Strategically, uh, we have what we call a less is more approach. So we would pref we would prefer to own fewer properties, but properties of a higher value, uh, which which allows us to pull a lot more asset management levers. Um, but if you look if you look across the Western Cape, there's 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 more than enough real estate. Um, you know whether you're looking at uh, small uh, mini industrial units, self storage units. Um, uh, you know those two those two in particular. I think a, um, a startup or a investor can, um, you know, can start there and, and grow into something larger. Uh, for us, you know, our view is that as a business, uh, when we started the, when we listed the business, our average property valuation was around 55 million rand per property. And we had a strategy that we wanted to, we only want to own properties that are valued at 100 million and above. And systematically, as we've gone through uh, from 2016 to today, that average value has increased to about 140 million per property. Um, and we will continue to kind of execute against that strategy uh, because we recently have only and because we want to be within call it one hour of every single one of our, of our assets. And just to give you an example, you know, you take someone like uh, Fortress. Fortress owns 
3 billion of assets in the Western Cape. Growth Point owns 27 billion of assets in the Western Cape. Redefine owns 15 billion of assets in the Western Cape. Spear owns just under 5 billion. And I mean, that's just like maybe four, four listed companies. Uh, then you have an incredible amount of privately held portfolios. Um, so within that kind of mix, there's always going to be opportunities to buy and sell, uh, people looking to downsize, people looking to upsize, uh, people that don't necessarily have a succession plan uh, in place, their children are not interested in real estate and they need somebody to actually come in and run it. Um, that's also where I think is a great opportunity if you can identify and build relationships with uh, people that run private portfolios that don't have a succession plan and go and immerse yourself in that business and learn from those people and, and, and then take, you know, take over the leadership mantle of that, um, uh, of that business uh, in the fullness of time. And so I missed miss one question. Um, good evening. My husband and I got our first property rentals through our personal finance. We have paid it off and we would like to get funding for our second building. I'm not sure what steps to take. We're in Soweto, Johannesburg, please advise. Um, yeah, so the property is, um, if the property is paid off, uh, you know, for us, you know, as a business, uh, on, that, on that portfolio that we have, we, we owe the bank 2.1 billion rand in debt. Uh, debt, isn't, debt isn't necessarily a bad thing uh, if you can use it, um, uh, if you can be disciplined. Um, so, you know, from my perspective, and this is, this is my advice, I'm not giving you financial advice, but this is my perspective, that um, at the moment we are probably entering some sort of a um, interest, we are entering an interest rate hiking cycle as a country and economy. Uh, however, if, uh, if the property is paid off, uh, my best recommendation would be, and it's something that you need to weigh up in line with your own personal financial position, is to leverage up a little bit on your, on your initial property to a point where you have a margin of safety in terms of the rent that you're earning versus the bond that you would have to, um, that you would have to pay back. And then utilize that as a deposit uh, on your second property and then get bank funding for uh, for the balance of that second property. Therefore, thereby you are actually then using your personal balance sheet as a tool um, to grow your, um, uh, your asset base and to grow your own balance sheet. Um, but but not, not to the extent where it places you under, um, you know, under financial pressure. So that would be my uh, kind of very short um, recommendation for, for that question. I think that's those are all the questions, uh, Marlene. Over to, uh, sorry, what are some of the measures one can use to evaluate properties? I think there's there's quite a few. So it depends if you're buying industrial, commercial, or retail. Um, but if you're buying an industrial property, uh, the first thing is you look at is to make sure that there isn't any asbestos in on the roof. Um, if you are looking at an industrial property, make sure it's got good yard area uh, in terms of. Um, for truck access, uh, you also make sure that uh, um, your floor to underside of your uh, uh, roof space uh, is conducive uh, to what the kind of demand in the market is from a storage perspective. And if you're looking at office space, uh, you want to look at um, office premises that are in, in good locations, uh, close to public transportation, uh, has a good parking ratio um, because unfortunately buildings with low parking ratios uh, tend to attract a uh, far lower uh, rental yield than properties with uh, decent parking ratios um, because you end up eliminating uh, rental opportunities out of, uh, out of your property. Uh, and also if you have the ability to acquire property, you know, try and acquire one with a lift, uh, we live in an environment where we are very aware that um, uh, we don't always have the ability, people don't always have the ability to take the stairs. And in terms of occupation, health and safety, you want to make sure that that is, um, uh, that is covered. And a personal favorite of mine is when I look at retail, I steer away from super regional retail and from, uh, from, the neighborhood, uh, from uh, regional retail. And I, I'm a big believer in convenience retail because the parking is free. People can park and walk into the, walk into the various shops. They buy what they require. They're not always heavily reliant on credit. Um, and your average rentals 
remain quite competitive in your occupancy rates uh, from a from a um, uh, against vacancies remains generally quite uh, quite consistent because you typically have a, a pick and pay, a clicks, a pick and pay clothing, a techie town, and one or two restaurants, a coffee shop, and then some other big box on the other side of your centre to kind of create a nice. Uh, pull from one side of the centre to the other, um, and then in terms of um, uh, mixed use, uh, we would look at um, mixed use opportunities of retail, commercial, and residential, uh, also in well-established nodes. And in Cape Town, in particular, um, you know, mixed use developments work very well um, because you're able to kind of create like an org organism type of lifestyle where you can have this live, work, play uh, type of environment. So those are the, some of the measures that, uh, that uh, we would look at. And um, rural, uh, rural urban migration has been a thing for decades now with people leaving their homelands to seek opportunities in the cities. There's been a global trade to populate cities with uh, countries like Egypt building new cities in remote areas for countries like South Africa. Do you think it's possible to lead a development project of that magnitude in a remote area like the Eastern Cape? Where the area has no resources or minerals to attract capital. Sure. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a it's a good question. Um, it comes down to political will, as far as um, as far as I'm concerned. I think that um, you know our government, uh, you know, if they had it, if they have to encourage development of that scale, particularly in the Eastern Cape, where we need it uh, desperately. Uh, would be to create very attractive um, tax regimes, like the like you find in the United States. You know, not every not every state has the same tax structure. You know, in Texas, there's specific tax incentives for development. Uh, in in versus New York, and and oftentimes what happens is that uh, companies would almost auction off um, their investment uh, to different parts of uh, of the federal state. Which would be something that I think our government, um, you know, should con strongly consider, uh, because not only would it attract um, capital, but it would attract, um, you know, capital in hard currency, which can go a lot, a lot further. And you know, historically, places like the Eastern Cape have been a massive uh, manufacturing, motor-related manufacturing um, uh, uh, hub. And uh, there's absolutely no reason for for that not to continue. And as that continues. Um, you know, to also flow through into manufacturing of um, of batteries for solar plants, to manufacture batteries for uh, electric vehicles, as an example. And um, yeah, I think uh, it doesn't actually have to have gold or platinum uh, to flourish. It's got to have political will. And I think um, you know, we all need to kind of um, trust that at some point in time, it's going to come a the light bulb will go on. Thank you so much for your questions, everyone. I think we can um, close the uh, question section. Um, we are now going to, I am now going to announce um, the uh, winner of the book giveaway. Um, it is a book by uh, Jim Collins and it is called Good to great, and the winner is Nompu Melelo Pungula. Thank you so much for uh, attending, and we will. Um, I would just like to also say thank you to Quinton Rossi. That was amazing. Your advice is so valuable, and um, we are motivated and I think a lot of the uh, participants uh, drew a lot of energy from what you were saying and um, and that is it thank you so much and have thank a good holiday everyone thanks Molly no, I really appreciate it thanks for the opportunity to um, to share with you guys and uh, yeah Listen, um, just want to encourage you guys that uh, there is no limit. Um, you just uh, need to, um, you know, have that goal. Um, the reality is that uh, building something is tough, uh, but when you build it uh, with the mindset of building it to last, it's worth it and it's measurable. 
And, uh, you know, you can really make an impact in people's lives that uh, would have a ripple effect. So have a blessed Christmas and I uh, wish you guys all the best and uh, your best days are still ahead of you. Thank you so 